Hello, everybody. Uh, one second while I fix the Zoom thing again, because as always, <laughs> it doesn't like it when we go from warm up to live. Uh, I hate this. I hate Zoom. I mean, I don't hate Zoom. I just I dislike this particular implementation feature of Zoom. There we go. All right, now YouTube can see us too. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our December AMA. Um, I keep trying to find ways to make that a smoother transition, and then I just get caught with a different trick each time. It's like you're debugging code. Um, welcome to our 50% uh, Christmas holiday-themed uh, AMA. Some folks came prepared with that in mind. Some folks, like me, did not. <clears throat> uh, so <laughs> I also like how Bram and I are both not in Christmas attire, and we're also both wearing gray. <laughs> we're just kind of like... Um, you guys are all still muted, by the way. Um so yeah, welcome everybody to our December AMA, probably our last AMA uh, for this year, uh, but we have a lot of fun stuff coming up still that we'll be doing more calls on uh, in the new year, in the not too distant future. Uh, like always, if you have questions that you want to ask, please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom webinar, not the chat. We do kind of keep an eye on the chat, but the Q&A feature is what we actually use the funnel questions through. If you're not in the Zoom, uh, Zoom webinar and are watching on YouTube, uh, I will try to pull questions from chat as I can. Uh, sometimes it flows fast. Sometimes I can keep an eye on it. No promises, but I will do my utmost best. So please don't be too much of a sad panda if I miss you. It probably was not intentional. It was just me being bad at my job. Uh, <laughs> with that said, uh, we've got uh, Jean and Justin and Bram with us today. Uh, anything you guys want to talk about or chat or say before we start with questions? Uh, no, I think we're going to have all the usual questions, so we should probably just do all the usual questions. <laughs> Actually, someone, the first question that just came through right now is basically, yeah, it was, it was like a bullet point of a couple of the most common questions. I Shall I knock those down? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, sure. <laughs> up, update on Project Asteroid. Uh, so, our side of the Project Asteroid project is almost complete and totally done, and that was mainly around Cat 1 standard. Uh, it is a project directly related to what we're doing with World Bank in Costa Rica, but our uh, partner there has not yet announced the final step, and we expect that to happen pretty soon after the beginning of the new year. So that's the update there. Um, the update on the IPO is exactly what I say every time everyone ever asks about the update on the IPO, which is we are on an accelerated timeline to go public, and we'll announce something when we can. Uh any concerned about XCH price? Certainly. Uh, you know, we would love to see the price more adequately reflect the progress we're making. But we think there's some various issues that are causing things there. You know, there are not as broad an American exchange capability yet. Um, we have some very fun things that are going to address that both directly and indirectly in the beginning of the year. Uh, and any more tech link-ups, immigrant, uh, World Bank, Costa Rica, et cetera? Yes. Okay. There. Answered. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Santa Jean, are you gonna are you gonna give gifts to the children? Are they gonna get uh, a little chia coin in their stocking? Or uh... I, I'm only interested in handing out coal to people who do proof of space. <laughs> I was gonna say there's there's somewhere in there's a coal and proof of space joke. I just didn't know or proof of proof work stake. joke. Yeah, proof, proof of stake. Proof of stake. Proof of stake. All right. Uh, the um, uh, exchange question has come up in a few places already. One exchanges. <laughs> uh, it's, we're working on those. We're working on them. Um, someone commented in the YouTube chat about the fact they saw we have a listing for a, a director of exchange relations, and yes, we do. Uh, to build off of a comment I made on a Reddit thread about that, don't take that job listing as an indicator of we've never done this before, now we're hiring someone to do it. Um, as I've said many times in the past, Gene and I and others have worked on these things up until now. Uh, it's just, it's now become a, a, enough of a job that the things we have to do mixed with doing that, it's better if we hire a full-time person to do it. So we're looking for someone who will hopefully help grease some of those wheels a bit more smoothly, but we'll see. Yeah. Also, there's an additional piece that I want everybody to be aware of. You know, there are the kind of top 10 exchanges, and that's not necessarily what this person is for. Uh, there are the be the long tail of exchanges, and there are quite a few smaller but interesting exchanges that we'd like to make sure we're on. And it ends up being a hell of a lot of paperwork and like a lot of phone tag to try to get some of those things done. Uh, plus, as the Chia Asset Token infrastructure starts to get more deployed, there's going to be a role for making sure that the centralized exchanges are listing those tokens. And so that's one of the things we wanted to have is someone to help coordinate with our partners, both in the ecosystem and our business partners, so that, you know, things like, I mean, Marmot Coin's a bad example, but getting Marmot Coin listed at exchanges might be kind of cool. On that, uh, Justin, what's the supply of Marmot Coin? 
<laughs> uh, so when I asked Preston about this, he said that uh, it was one issue, one to one issuance. So one coin for every marmot that exists uh, on the island of uh, the, the island of uh, west of uh, British Columbia, uh, helped by Vancouver. Um, I think that the actual issuance is like proof of charity at this point. Uh, I know that uh, there was a rumor that if you donated to the Marmot Fund and helped them do their Marmot rescue efforts, he was willing to issue you a coin for that. Um, probably the the total issuance is going to be when Preston gets bored with this, but uh, since it's for charity, uh, I think we'll probably be able to convince him to do it for a while. And the Marmot Coin Charity noticed that it was all Gia folks, so thank you all. Yeah, thank you guys, yeah, seriously, for your generosity. They definitely had a, a spike, apparently. <laughs> um, uh, any any top list of themes Chia Network is looking for on the grants program? Uh, yeah, so obviously, you know, we're not limiting grant potential recipients to, like, certain things, but there are certain things we'd like to see, you know, primarily things that are going to um, inject – uh, ideation and spur kind of a, a snowball's growth of creativity in the ecosystem. Uh, also, things that sort of play into uh, now that we have cats, things that play into cats and exchanging them and leveraging them and you know converting them perhaps and you know things that will actually make cats. An individual developer of a cat can create some pretty interesting functionality for them, but allowing those cats to then interact with the blockchain and other cats and other things, you know, platforms and tools that might help with that would be very interesting to us, I think. Anything else, Gene? Yeah, I was going to say that we're probably likely to expand the uh, grants page to add a list of things that we very particularly are also looking for. Mm -hmm. um, there's certainly some things floating around where, you know, they're not likely to get to our top of uh, funnel effort-wise, but would be very interesting to have support. And I'll give a great example of that. Uh, BTC Pay Server, uh, you know, there's an entire, like, uh, plug-in infrastructure there that allows you to take most any cryptocurrency for an e-commerce site, and it makes sense to have Chia be one of those supported. And that's one of those, you know, much easier, this is your first Chia project kind of development projects to do. Yeah, there was also talk, uh, I, I admittedly know that we have not yet listed some of the grant recipients on the page. It was because we had one to put up that everyone knew, which is Knuckle, and we had a few in the works that weren't ready to announce yet, and I didn't want to just put one up by itself. I wanted to wait till we had a couple. Those are now... We can, we can share some of them or are going to be able to over the holidays. So there's going to be an update to the page probably in January with a list of a bunch of grant recipients. And there's been a talk internally when we talked about that. I even kind of said, do we want to put like a, a bounty list of like, you know, hey, if you've got something for specifically these three or four things, or if you want to make something and you don't really know where you want to start, think about these things. We will probably add that with that same refresh. Uh, I got a question here for you, Gene. Uh, will Chia Network be involved directly with CATS stablecoins? Or is that entirely up to the community and businesses? So it uh, depends on the word involved means. Um, you know, we are definitely going to see CAT stable coins. Uh, in certain cases, we are reaching out to folks. Uh, you'll see more news on that in the new year. But ultimately, we believe we're one of the best asset issuance token platforms ever. And for any serious uh, stable coin provider, I think they're going to want to be in the market for carbon credits and all the other things that are coming on chain and ver are very real. So... So I think you can feel very confident that there's going to be uh, quite a few uh, stablecoin offerings on the Chia blockchain in certainly some in the next quarter and some in the first half. All right. Um, another one for Eugene. Uh, you mentioned in the past about an update to the green paper. Has this been done or any progress to report? Although I, I do want to clarify, was it green paper or was it the white paper? Because I remember seeing you make a comment in Cubase about the white paper being updated. Is it the same? Did you mention both or? It's both, actually. Now, I've not mentioned it at the same time, but it's probably worth just talking about both of them. Um, we are uh, about to get an internal draft of the green paper, which kind of updates the new consensus document and the old green paper into one overall document. And I know Bram and Christoph are back and forth on that in real time. Um, I uh, have on my plate updating the business white paper uh, just to kind of bring it up to speed. And there were some very positive changes around uh, the financing we did back in May. Uh, and just, you know, catching it up on the facts of World Bank, Costa Rica, and some of the other things. And just also, uh, you know, sharing some more of the learnings we've seen from the marketplace so far. Things like, uh, not everyone knows, but uh, Harvard uh, Business School did a, use case, a 
case study is the right word, uh, on Chia and taught it right before Thanksgiving. And it was fascinating because we kind of got the students around to, you know, pass their blockchain skepticism, but we're still kind of skeptical, like, is this really important? And what we found is that it directly cut down to who was American and who wasn't. The non-American folks were like, whoa, whoa, hey, hey, if they can do any sort of stuff they're talking about, this is critical to you know anybody that's not in the pound, euro, or dollar region. And we're finding that, too, in our actual kind of go-to-market pipeline. You know, I, I kind of hinted at this before, but there's a lot of governments, and they're generally the either smaller OECD or non-OECD nations that are really interested in using this to solve real problems. Um, got a, another question here uh, from the YouTube chat, actually. Uh, Gene, why is your Christmas hat red and not green? <laughs> it was the one I could find in the last few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh let's jump around here a little bit give justin a chance to chat uh justin uh someone wants to know if they've got one to 11 running and they forget all about it uh do you expect it to keep working for several years or is it going to cause issues for the network and i guess maybe bram could weigh in on this too because we've, we, we've had some discussions in the past about when we want people to upgrade or encourage them to upgrade or not um and when it doesn't really matter yeah, um, sure, I can answer that one. So right, you you will probably be able to run 1.2.11 in perpetuity, uh, barring there being something like the concerns we had on the uh, the release we did a couple versions ago where there was potential for a block to lock it. Uh, outside of that, uh, the software should be able to continue to run. Obviously, I would recommend as an operational person that you upgrade software, especially software you use to make financial transactions. Uh, but I can't come to your house and do that for you. So if you wanted to run an older version as updates are added to the platform, that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, I think that we do offer a pretty strong carrot for update in that we are rolling in lots of really great improvements and lots of speed improvements and plotter improvements and things you might be interested in. But if none of that stuff interests you, you can certainly run uh, any stable version of the Chia software. I would say starting at 1 to 11 is probably prudent because of the bugs we discovered and fixed. Uh, but there's nothing that precludes you from being able to run it, barring obviously things I can't foresee discovering in the future. Okay, cool. Um, I got two questions in here about uh, the upcoming discussions around a buy XCH button on the website. Um, have we thought about a sell XCH button as well? And uh, will the buy XCH be a direct fiat on ramp via like a card network or ACH option? So uh, because it's something we're going to be announcing specifically, I have to be a touch vague, but uh, it is absolutely a bi-directional market and it would be an excellent place for farmers to be able to get liquidity instead of having to go to an exchange. It will be much cheaper. It'll be much more direct and it'll use the technology in its very native way. So yes, it is going to be a bi bi-directional market. I think people will be really excited about it. And it's also going to be a relatively easy on-ramp. It may a, it will be the easiest way for an American to buy Chia full stop in the short run. Um, uh, switching gears a little bit. Uh, we got a question. Uh, I think efficient is in chat. You can deep dive into this a lot deeper if folks want to in the chat. But the general question is, uh, when's an NFT standard going to be released? Uh, we're waiting for Chia Punks, Chia Apes, etc. Um, NFTs are, are something we've talked about, but not something that we have, you know, worked on a specific standard for right now, I think. Um, there's still more I think probably need to do on that. I know, Bram, you've been kind of thinking about it a little bit in, in advance of when we actually need it, kind of noodling over what a standard might look right, right? Or which thing? NFTs. NFTs. NFTs, yeah. We're actively working on building our NFT standard. Um, uh, core features are, well, first off, like with cats, it's not an API, it's an actual chunk of code. Um, and it's going to have hooks for future sophisticated rules about how transfer of ownership of an NFT can go. The, the general idea is going to be you'll have a DID, a distributed identity, which is the current owner of an NFT. And the NFT can be sold to someone else and move over to them. Um, we're going to be building into the standard inner thing in an NFT the uh, functionality of every time it's transferred slash sold, a percentage of the price is paid back to the original issuer because people seem to like that feature. Um, and in the interests of 
helping keep people from defrauding the original issuer, both the seller and the recipient are going to ha have to opt into reporting what the price paid is to the, um, to the NFT itself. Sort of a highlights of implementation details that we're working on there. All right. Um, going on to something a little uh, more technical and less uh, producty. Uh, how's the progress on the blue box Time Lord uh, compression efforts? Uh, there's been a couple blog posts lately about people doing some some challenges to see who can you know get it going down. And I know we have we have some actual charts that kind of there's there's the what's it called? Are we compactified yet? I think is the website. But then we've got our own kind of charts and graphs as well, don't we, Justin? About that. Indeed, we do. Um, so I want to I want to couch this by saying uh, I don't want to call this like a competition because uh, can you enable me to screen share, please? I've uh, got your screen shared if you want. OK, cool, cool. Um, I don't want to label this as a competition. Uh, this is something that is it's fun. There is no reward. This is very intentionally not a proof of work functionality on our blockchain. And so feel free to participate and throw up a blue box, but this is not like a call to arms for everybody. But I will say this, I'm very impressed by how much you guys were able to bend the curve just with like boxes you're running out in, you know, out in the ether. Uh, and we turned our, uh, you can see uh, what, how far does it, can you go back to the, can you go back to the two weeks, Gene, maybe? Yeah, seven days. Okay, so you can see uh, the first inflection point here on this graph is when uh, I turned on our, um, I turned back on our stuff or we did my team. And then the second inflection point, that's not me at all. Like that's you guys. So really cool. Like this is, and we're getting very close. I think the numbers we ran were a couple of weeks to fully compacted. Um, we are obviously, we're probably ahead of that now. Uh, so once we hit, uh, the inflection point though, like there's really no need to keep running them. So We'll probably put out a call to be like, hey, if you're running a blue box just for fun, you can turn it down. We'll probably turn our fleet down until uh, we kind of hit an equilibrium. And then I'll put in automation in place that kind of does a trend line here and tries to make, make the trend line flat where based on what, you know, what the community is Yeah, we is should probably doing. tweak our blue box stuff so that if it notices that things are getting handled pretty well, it chills out a bit and isn't so yeah. aggro about trying to blue box constantly. Yeah, the nice part is once we catch up, the daily is the daily and it's just what it is and it's flat. Yep, exactly. Our, our goal is to be at, at zero, you know, all the time and, and have no excess compute burnt on that. Uh, we have some plans for that. And then we'll, you know, as Bram said, we can probably add tools to make that uh, easier for you to do operationally as well. Cool. Um, speaking of uh, blocks in the database, uh, when plot compression tool? <laughs> I know we, we tease this a lot, kind of a little bit in the past. Uh, okay. Um, so... We've been a little bit indulgent about our work on plots. So <laughs> for those, this is going to be probably more information than anyone really cares to hear, but uh, with plots. So we have, um, uh, we wish to make it so that the plot format that we are making available to everyone is as compressed as possible. So no one has advantaged proprietary plotting tools. Um, the um, we have in the works, uh, so, so if I may list out the upcoming things, there's a whole bunch of straightforward, simple block and tackle things that compress straightforwardly. Um, and uh, Slava's probably about halfway done with a tool that further compresses plot files that way. However, it's an extra pass. So after you're done plotting, you can run this over your finished plot file. And it's mostly just a single pass over your data. It's reasonably fast. Um, and it will make the whole thing about, uh, I think about 4% compressed, like really quite a bit. Um, that, that's all, that basically exhausts all the straightforward um, uh, compression things that can be done. Uh, we've been a little bit sidetracked doing analysis because <laughs> I figured out <laughs> some future stuff that can be done here. Um, uh, there, there's some theoretical further compression that's really kind of interesting that's related to really interesting CS theory questions about uh, compressing uh, permutations in a way where you can still do fast lookups. Um, that 
is um, uh, we've now finished that analysis. We got a little distracted doing it. That has theoretical savings of half a percent. In practice, it would be a little bit less than that. That is pretty radical changes to the formats and with known techniques isn't really practical on spinning disk, but is on SSD in terms of the format. It's too many seeks to really do on a spinning disk in a practical way. Um, interesting theory question of whether it can be do better or yada, yada, yada. Anyhow, it's known that those theoretical improvements cap out around half a percent. Uh, but so we're gonna do a write-up of what those are and how you would go about doing them using the techniques we figured out. And then, uh, but, uh, Probably in a you know a, a month or two time frame, the plot compression that we've been working on and got a little sidetracked about this interesting future stuff uh, will be working. However, there's a few steps here. There's getting that working, and then there's getting um, making it so that the plotters like plot directly to the newly compressed format, so you don't have to like make your plot and then compress it. It just comes out compressed. Uh, that that's some work to be done there. Uh, the theoretical stuff I was talking about might maybe actually speed up plotting. That's a whole involved subject. Um, uh, other things we have in the works worth plotting is we are going to make it so that multiple different plotters can at least run in a mode where they have zero drop, uh, which might slow down plotting an amount that's not worth it. Uh, uh, for the pretty marginal like amount of extra stuff you get out of your plots when it's done for that. However, having multiple plotters that have no drops in the process of plotting means that you can then compare their outputs, which now should be byte identical. So just as a matter of <laughs> software quality assurance, we really, really want to have that feature in there, um, that getting them to make byte identical outputs. Uh, also further things, um, Aside from all the stuff that I just mentioned, there's two further sources of theoretical compression that can be done. Um, the, there's inlining cross tables that might have a theoretical potential compression of one or 2%, or it might not. That's, that's really hard to analyze and we don't really know how to build it. But much more importantly, <laughs> there's helmet attacks that we keep reminding everyone or coming up at some point. Uh, Hellman attacks. Uh, I'm actually surprised that no one else has written Hellman attack stuff because we know there are people who have the skill set out there to do it because they did it on burst, although they haven't admitted as much that that was what they actually did. But yeah, they definitely did Hellman attacks on burst. Uh, you can do Hellman attacks on the first table of our Prusa base, but not the others. That will save you about five to 10% of your plot size with the fairly significant trade-off for the amount of time plotting takes uh, in, order, uh, in order to get that functionality. Um, uh, so that will, that is on the roadmap to be done in the future. <laughs> um, okay, and so that was probably more information that people really wanted to hear about our upcoming uh, plotting plans. I guess the short answer is, I, I'm guessing, and I could be totally wrong, that, uh, that the plot compression will probably be done about two months from now, but I, I, I'm not supposed to say dates, but it, it, we're about halfway done with actually implementing that. And sorry, I got it a little derailed from um, uh, all this really super interesting theory stuff that about uh, what are the theoretical limits of plot compression and what are the techniques for I that. Think, I think that's why people like when we have you on the AMAs is because you just, you you educate them on all kinds of stuff they actually didn't even, <laughs> didn't even know they didn't know, so. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, I, I continue to be amazed that there's no, like, that no one's like, hey, I have this super special proprietary plotter farmer thing that can squeeze an extra 5% out of your space uh, based off of a helmet attack, because we know there are people with the necessary skills to build that out there, and they have not, to our knowledge, uh, done so. That's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Um, Gene, I uh, got a yeah. question from our good friend Chris over at the Chia Plot. Uh, I'm not going to read his entire question verbatim because it's a paragraph. No offense, Chris. I'm not trying to editorialize you. I'm just trying to keep this concise. But ultimately, uh, he's been looking on working on some pieces around the full node and being able to host things in the cloud to get around networking issues and working around things like national firewalls and censorship and stuff. And in the process of all that, uh, he's been looking at the database and wants to know um, if there's anything we can do or are planning to do about the size of the database solutions to make some of the above more viable. I know we've said in the past many times that we have put almost, if not completely, zero effort into optimizing the DB and that we will 
when we were able to pivot back to working on that in the time game. So do you want to talk to that, Any? Yes, I do. Uh, so, you know, I'll reiterate that we put absolutely no effort into getting the database to be small in any way, and I will explain how we know that in just a second. Uh, but I do want to echo what Chris is talking about here is a good idea for some, uh, especially if you're in Europe with uh, carrier-grade NAT, you know, using the harvester protocol and the farmer protocol to, to have your node out in the cloud and then, you know, pierce through your your kind of painful networking back to where your drives are. That's actually a completely valid and good use case. Um I don't want to get into how good the preliminary results are in our version two database numbers because I don't want to commit to them, but like cutting it in half may very well be on the table uh, and being more performant at the same time. So uh, there are early PRs on that. You, know, you feel free to you know browse around in the PRs. You'll see it and you'll see some of the timing details. Again, those details are probably more optimal than they would be in actual running, but we're actually out kind of doing that um, uh performance monitoring as we speak. I, when I say we, we should say Arvid is. He's being amazing at this. And so, you know, sometime in the new year, there's going to be a version two of the database format. Uh, there will be a, you know, way to move from version one to version two without rethinking. Uh, but you will generally want to be one or the other uh, so that we don't have kind of these weird, uh, you know, trying to read both databases situations. Yeah, the... Um... The we're sticking with SQLite for now at, uh, because we can get enough optimizations to keep SQLite working well enough for now. We will probably be moving to something a little less easily, trivially flexible, but a little more performant at some point in the future, but that's not necessitated immediately. Yeah, and for those who often speculate that that would be a column or database, it may literally be the file system instead, mostly. And and to, to reiterate Gene's point, we don't want to get people's excitement around specific numbers because um, what works in a lab, so to speak, doesn't necessarily work in the real world and might not translate one to one, or it may not pass our optimization and our performance metrics that we wanted to see. But if you understand this kind of stuff and do want to learn more, like he said, you can just look at GitHub and look at our events commits and kind of poke through the changes we're making and kind of get a sense for yourself of where it's currently trending. If you're really, really curious. Some community folks have asked questions about that and they they seem as excited as Arvid is. So yeah, I, yeah. P people who really follow that closely were already like, yeah. whoa, what's going on here? Uh, and this is, this is kind of the fun thing about being like working on an open source project is that um, we, you know, we can't easily communicate every single thing we're working on until we're ready to talk about it. And we actually know where it's headed and have ideas of like finalized projects and release dates. But having the, 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 the tinkering and the working kind of visible that like the people who understand that stuff can poke at it. It's kind of fun seeing them get excited in real time as we get excited about the results of our efforts. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, and look, you know, we want you to look through GitHub and see what's going on and see all the activity. You know, uh, most of the activity is not in Maine because Maine, well, it is some. Point being, like, there's some long-lived branches that are out there doing really interesting new features that are getting merged back in, that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, maybe someday we'll do a GitHub explainer. Hmm. We could do that. That would be fun. Yeah. Um, so, Gene, we've had some discussions coming up recently a lot in Keybase where people have been kind of theorizing and discussing about the uh, ASIC Time Lords. And I've actually seen the similar discussions at the same time in some of the Discord communities run by some of the pool operators. Uh, is there any updates or status updates on that project that you can talk about that we've announced sure. previously? So, uh, you know, I would say that the hardware development is going well. Um, we're, uh, you know, if anything, on time. I will say that we may be... Uh, internally a quarter slower than we originally planned to because we're getting hit with the shortages too. Um, so some of the ancillary things you need to be able to put these together are in short supply out there. Think, uh, uh, you know, USB or PCI uh, adapter uh, chips, literally. Um, looks like we might get as much as a 2-3x speed up over the standard situation. But again, this falls in that same category of, you know, final numbers to be seen. We've got to see what those first shell numbers look like. Um, it is going to be one of two form factors. It's either going to be likely a USB, probably three, may or may not have a wall wart, um, because three may be able to give us enough power, but we're not sure yet. Um, or it may literally be PCI. Uh, so it's just going to go in a regular PCI slot and get power off the motherboard directly. Um, it has three VDF clients on it. So the actual squarings all take place on the chip. But then the inter intermediaries to create the proofs comes back over that data connection and the machine running it will be doing the proof building uh, and publishing the proofs. 
But it does mean that the kind of state of the art uh, Time Lord goes from three machines to one. Uh, that one has to be decent, but not super great. So no longer do you have to have the state of the art there. Uh, there will be some interesting opportunities for people who want to try to overclock the ASIC, but I think we're going to be at a pretty high clock speed starting it, and so it's not clear to me you're going to get much stability at a higher clock speed on the ASIC that we're going to deliver. Um, we're never going to make money on the ASIC, but it is not going to be free. Um, so we'll probably sell it somewhere between $250,000 a, a pop. We'll have a limited number, especially early, um, just because of the way we're going to manufacture it. We're not doing a high-scale manufacturing. Uh, now, also I'll add that, you know, I think, Second half is when you should kind of expect that to potentially pop up on our website. Um, to the extent we can update, we will some. Uh, but as soon as we're done with that, we'll probably be turning around and doing a more expressive uh, version of that once we've learned what we've learned through that process. So, you know, every couple years, it wouldn't surprise me if we have some ASIC upgrades, though I expect that to slow down very quickly. Um, we are targeting a even uh, somewhat surprisingly small uh, process even here. Uh, and the real steps are, you know, smaller processes. Uh, the backlog in the chip world means that we can't get too small too fast. But at the same time, the end of Moore's law is something we've always kind of been betting on where there's a certain size here where a single core, which is what these VDF clients fundamentally are, just really can't go faster. Yeah, what are we targeting now? It's like 15 nanometer or something. It's way less. Yeah, than I, 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 we were thinking it was going to be like 28, but we're down yeah. we're down below 20. And it's a question of which exact process we're going to use. But, you know, again, this calls in that category of that's where we are. Generally, please don't yell at us when it's like <laughs> not that number or smaller, like, you know. Yeah, uh, there, there's also a chance. We'll see how this goes. So there's the G hardware. I'm always forgetting my acronyms, but the 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 they we might have working hardware. It, hardware that's not ASIC, but is it easy to make hardware? FPGA. That's FPGA. Yeah, we might have FPGA that is comparable to IFMA on a desktop. Um, sooner, which we're going to be using internally just to make sure our tool chain works. Um, yeah. But we might be able to make something people might be interested in available with that sooner before our actual ASICs are available. So, yeah, so the, the, yeah. I was, was going to say two things. Uh, I know Bram has to leave shortly, so I want to make mm -hmm. sure if there's any questions in the queue real quick, Bram, that you want to have a specific one you want to answer or address before you have to go. Uh, I want to give you the chance to do that. Uh, and then second of all, as I say, someone did just ask while we're on the topic of these, uh, are these ASICs going to be able to act as blue boxes as well as Time Lords? Uh, there's no reason they shouldn't be able to blue box. That's correct. Um, the one thing I did want to say on the FPGA front is that unfortunately that's relatively going to be expensive because the FPGA base that we're going to have to use there would likely be in the kind of call it $10,000 per range and you'd need three of them. Um, they will be available. We'll obviously make it available so people know about it, but it's going to be a different kind of price point if you want to play the game there. Now, we're going to play that game because, you know, buying six of those are well within budget. Favorite <laughs> um, part of my job. Mm -hmm. it, uh, okay, so thing I'd like to answer and just give the answer I feel like. So someone asks, uh, when will the pre-farm be put into a custodial wallet? Uh, we would really like the pre-farm to be in a custodial wallet, uh, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, um, uh, we, uh, on our rather large list of things to do. We have an embarrassment riches of, of riches of amazing projects to work on that we're working on right now. Um, definitely custodial wallets are, uh, better custodial wallets are one of them. We're gonna build it, we're gonna make it open source. We're gonna dog food it ourselves and make it available as a general purpose tool that other people can use as well. Cause uh, I think that a better custody is like a core feature of blockchain technology um, generally. Um, so sometime next year, <laughs> can't promise dates right now. Um, in the first half. Yeah. The, the, uh, we're on the list of things that we're working on right now. There's a bunch of things thing I wanted to mention that I'm pretty excited about, uh, just because I'm noodling on it actually is there's on chain gaming. So, and I uh, hear I'm being pretty indulgent. So, um, in terms of games of skill to be played on chain, uh, in terms of the ones that make the most sense, uh, poker is a big outlier. That's the one that's really compelling. Um, however, there's this one thing in poker that's highly problematic, which is you shuffle the cards. So you have this thing where you and I both have whole cards, and but we need to be able to audit that the other person knows what their whole cards are, but they're not the same as our whole cards. Um, uh, but 
but we don't know what their whole cards are, but we know what our own whole cards are. So uh, there are cryptographic protocols for doing this. They're complicated, they're wacky, they're difficult, especially when you need to be able to have a fallback to actually do them on chain. So it turns out um, card removal effects aren't all that strong in uh, Hold'em. So I came up with, and I hope people don't get too mad at me about this here. I came up with a poker variant which just accepts this and makes it so you can have repeats of cards. Uh, I have rules worked out for that. There's subtleties around the edge cases. Uh, short of it is there's no, uh, everyone has like just gets two whole cards and five cards get out on the table. However, there might be repeats. Also, there are no ranks uh, among them, uh, but uh, so flushes are gone, uh, but quints, you can have five of a kind is a potential hand now. Um, and uh, a thing I'd like to add that really makes a lot of sense here is you have a bit in addition to your two whole cards, you have a bit which is your boosted or not, which you have a one in three chance of getting. And if both players have the same type of hand, then and one of them is boosted and the other one isn't, then the one who has a boost wins. So those are quick high level thoughts about on chain poker. So we might have a thing where you can play uh, in a payment channel poker with somebody else on chain and Chia, where the only time you need a transaction is when you're setting up the session and closing it down. Uh, and you can do this with someone who you don't trust. Uh, you, they, they can end the session, but they can't end the session mid hand. Uh, that, that's enforced. Um, and, uh, and there's no rake. So I think that's something poker players might get pretty excited about if they don't mind the fact that it's actually a poker variant. Hopefully it's one they actually like. So, yeah. Win poker champion. <laughs> well, there's, cool. there's also arbor shoppers opportunity there, right? If you wanted to set up a layer two app and be the person who shuffles the decks and takes a rake for that, there's, there's probably- uh, Yeah, but you, then you need to there. be a trusted party and yeah, people exactly. trust you. That's, that's the, the idea is to make it so it's something where there's no trusted third party whatsoever. I'm excited to play. Yeah, all right. And now I got to drop. Thanks everybody. Hey. Thanks, Bram. See you, Bram. Thanks, Bram. Um, we are coming up on 40 minutes in. Uh, there's a couple of questions that I think have kind of quick answers, so maybe we'll lightning around through a couple of simple things. Uh, one person in YouTube has uh, asked, um, uh, or I guess maybe complained, I don't know. Uh, Bram promised an IPO in 2021. Why aren't we doing it in 2021? Uh, Gene kind of touched an IPO at the start, but you know, simply, if you had never been a part of an IPO before, two things. One, you have a lot of minimal agency over exactly when it happens. There's many outside factors. Uh, two is it, there's a lot you can't talk about the process. You just can't, uh, including when it's going to happen. So. And three, we never said twenty one. We said accelerated. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, so there's, there's the processes are very complicated. We'll just say that. Um, we also have um, where to go. What do we think about chives? Uh, chives is a cool fork. There's a lot of cool forks out there. I think of all the forks out there that are having efforts put into them by the people actually making them. Chives is one of the few that actually has having people saying more than just let's relabel Chia and get rid of the pre-farm. It's let's actually change some of the core functionality for one reason or another. And they're actually putting time and resources into that, which is interesting. Uh, there's a much more limited number of forks that are doing that, I think. Um, there is, uh, where did it go? I had one right here a second ago that was, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, oh, uh, what happened to Project Asteroid on the Trello board? Uh, it appears to have been removed. Uh, or we, should we expect an announcement this month because of that? Is it complete? <laughs> Yeah, well, it is complete from our side, uh, but it's not going to necessarily drive the announcement timing. But yes, it's probably announcement soon. No guarantees. Um, I, I wish, I wish JM was here for this one. Uh, Gene, can we talk a little bit about the circular drive initiative? Yeah. So, uh, the circular drive initiative is a partnership between us, Bill McDonough. And if you know about Bill, you'll know he's kind of the father of circular economies and a lot of the, uh, growing efforts around the world economic forum to try to create better outcomes, uh, here, uh, and Seagate and Western digital. And there's kind of two core things we're going to try to do here. Uh, first, when drives are uh, taken out of service by the hyperscale data centers and enterprises, they generally have four or five years left of life on them. Uh, we're going to try to inject some liquidity and some lending in there so that those drives are getting out to farmers and being farmed for that ent entire period. 
Now, you know, something like 25% of those farm, those drives are going to die in the you know, first year or two in that second lifetime period. Both that and their end of life, Seagate and Western Digital are starting taking these drives back and actually reharvesting and reconditioning these drives back to, you know, new drives that will have a much smaller footprint on the total ecosystem when they're built. And uh, you should expect more announcements there as we partner with people even beyond the farming ecosystem. I mean, one of the neatest things about the Circular Drive Initiative is it's not just farmer drive impact. It's the entire hyperscale data center world drive impact. Uh, there's, I, I've got a two for one here for you, Eugene. Before I do that, there's one that I missed when I was trying to uh, clear through the YouTube queue. Someone had also asked if there's any updates we have on the dust storm. Um, I think, uh, if the per if this person, if you haven't seen, we did do a complete like retro kind of Q and A session stream on the dust storm. Uh, that was pretty much that. That was our post mortem. That was kind of the the retroactive on it, and and. and pun intended, kind of done and dusted at that point. Um, if there are outstanding questions people have specifically about the dust storm that they feel we haven't addressed, feel free to ask them and we'll try to answer those specifics. But as far as updates on it, we've pretty much covered everything we want to on that in that Q&A stream, which is should be, if you're watching this on YouTube, it's, it's archived in our, our video stream down below there. Um, so for Eugene, uh, two questions in one. One from YouTube is uh, simply, are we um, having plans or, or designs in the near future to work closer with hardware manufacturers to get uh, hardware support, uh, both for enterprise solutions like exchanges and things like Ledger, uh, as well as uh, multi-sig support. And then along with that, we have a question in the Q&A queue specifically about our uh, looking for an exchange relations director. Would that include this person working with someone like, say, Ledger to encourage them to bring on support for Chia? So I'll answer the second part of that question first, which is that person would not generally be the person we'd have interfacing with folks like Ledger. We are fully engaged with Ledger. Um, Ledger shipped BLS support in G1 in their last uh, upgrade, and we are trying to figure out exactly what the timing looks like for their next upgrade. Um, may make the next one, maybe the one after, hard for us to exactly say because we don't obviously own their schedule, but we are fully engaged there. There are also some interesting other uh, partners who are looking to move into this space that are going to be, uh, I think, very interesting new uh, private key management solutions here. All right. Um, going back to the IPO for a second, someone has asked you, Mr. Hoffman, mm -hmm. uh, the, oh, I lost it. Uh, regarding the IPO, uh, do we have any updated thoughts or ideas on the early farmer priority benefit that had been discussed in the past? Is that, is that still possible or is it learning to become unfeasible? Yeah, it's still certainly possible, but it has a lot to do with how we go public. Um, one of the options that's a bit more common these days is to use what's called a special purpose acquisition company, or a SPAC. And if we did that, it would make it harder for us to be able to implement the plan that we were thinking about, which is fundamentally saying to early farmers, and we'll have to figure out what the definition of early is, that if you did win a block in a certain period, that you'd be able to use proof of keys and be able to get an allocation of a classic S1-style IPO. Um, to the extent we do that, we still think that's an, a viable opportunity. Um, we have not made a call about exactly which direction we're going to go there. So it's still on the table. Um, it does require uh, you know, our investment banks and others uh, buy-in, but I don't expect much of a pushback on that. Um, it's something that a lot of companies have done, Uber, Lyft, um, others beforehand. So you know, it's something that's kind of well understood. Uh, you know, uh, Bram and our intent is to do it, uh, but as I said, some of the macro issues may mean that we don't really have the opportunity to do it the same way. Uh, I will say, though, once we're public, uh, it changes what we can do at the pre-farm, and there might be some fun things we can do around, like, holiday farming extras. You know, those are things we definitely have in the playbook, but that's post being public. Okay. Uh, Justin, we've let you be quiet for a little too long here. Uh uh, any estimate timelines for the new wallet to be merged into the main app? And um, do we have plans on supporting mobile ourselves because uh, uh, the Knuckle and Arbor wallet moving to mobile has excited a lot of people? Uh, so I'll answer this backwards. Uh, the first one is sure. Um, I don't know that it's like on the roadmap right now. I think we're still working on perfecting that piece of software and, and making it work on the, the platforms we have a uh, a better working ecosystem with, uh, but that doesn't preclude that we could do, uh, you know, cell phone applications. I just don't think we're tooled up for right now, that right now. And uh, frankly, maybe that's a better thing to pursue with partners once we have our stuff ironed out. Um, but you know, I can't speak for the product team. I think that that's probably something they're absolutely looking at. But I don't know that it's right away. We're still working on getting the the wallet out of beta, so I wouldn't hold your breath on that. Um, and then the 
first part of the question was with the timeline. So initially, I believe we were trying to have everything merged back into Maine by the end of this month. I don't know if we're going to hit that 100%. I don't want to speak for uh, the other engineers who I haven't heard reports from for a couple of days now. Uh, but I believe that we're on track for, if not the end of this month, early January. I know that we're looking to move the testnet 10 uh, that is for the kind of that cats branch that we have in beta um, out to the the main public testnet and retire testnet seven next week so uh, that's you know one of the next steps in this timeline and so very soon um, if not the end of this month early january maybe as soon as the end of next week but that would be probably a hail mary i wouldn't say that that's uh likely okay um uh, do, do, do. Speaking of that, you mentioned cats. Uh, one of our viewers says they're still a little confused about the difference between a cat and an F and uh, F and NFT. <laughs> between a cat and an NFT, uh, are they not one and the same? They're not. Um, so both of them are similar in the sense that they control how they can be spent and what they become when they get spent. An NFT is controlled in a way that it only can remain itself. So it can continue to be just an NFT, and only one of them. Hence the, the non-fungible aspect Non-fungible, the name. right. Um, a Chia Asset token, you can create one coin with a million Chia Asset tokens in it and spend it into two coins with half a million Chia Asset tokens in one and half a million Chia Asset tokens in the other. It's really the difference between a Babe Ruth baseball card and casino chips. The Babe Ruth baseball card is the NFT. Casino chips is the Chia Asset token. Okay. Um, we had a, a follow-up question that popped up while you were talking about uh, the the IPO and and then the giving out rewards to farmers for that. Uh, they asked, "Have we considered uh, doing a direct listing for IPO?" A direct listing is definitely one of the options on the table, uh, but uh, I didn't mention it earlier in my answer because, of course, the direct listing would mean that the there would not be the same sort of farmer opportunities if we did it that way. Okay. Um. So it seems uh, NetSpace has stabilized recently in the past month or so. What's uh, what is the trend on the number of full nodes in relation to that? It's pretty stable. Uh, we see somewhere between two and three hundred thousand full nodes at this point. Um, there were also, I think, some questions about how do we count that. Uh, the Chia DNS crawler is now actually mostly merged into Main, I believe, uh, and that is the tool we use. It's got some uh, rough edges. So we're actually out kind of cleaning. And in fact, I think there was a PR this morning to clean part of it up. Uh, but that's the core tool we use. It kind of all checks out that those numbers are right. Uh, a good example of this is that uh, if you look at the amount of net space that I believe it's Space Pool has, and you look at their farmer count, it implies about 375,000 farmers. Uh, and you know, obviously, that's probably a little bit of a discount because there's a bias towards larger uh, farmers not being in a pool. But again, that kind of points back again to that two to three hundred thousand number, maybe even three twenty-five. And to piggyback on that note about we're updating the crawler, uh, we are actively getting better stats. Uh, I think we've we're be able to we're able to produce now what I think is a former accurate node number. Uh, we're working that into our. Um, panels that we have that I, you know, I've shared screens with you guys before. And we are going to take this to public. It's just the, there's a lot of rough edges in it. I don't know that it would be productive in its current state. But I think this next iteration, maybe there's some value in taking that stuff. Uh, one of the big improvements we're going to be able to have is we'll be able to do GOIP and be able to tell you, based on a general heat map, like where, what regions Chia is very popular in and, and kind of how many nodes are in specific regions, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I also believe there was a Reddit thread where someone was doing this analysis in his database, and it was, you know, China was like 30,000, and the U.S. was like 27,000. And then the thing we have seen is that, you know, Russia, Turkey, some others are often overrepresented a bit, Germany uh, being on that list. I like to think that might be uh, Bram fanboys, but we'll see. <laughs> I, I also think um, something, because there was a comment thread on that where I was tagged and asked to kind of weigh in on it, and, I, you know, it, it, it's interesting. It is, it is definitely interesting data, and I think it's very um, fun to look at, but there's also the fact that this is all connections to this one person's database, and as I'm sure Justin can attest, um, it is a very uniquely non-random sample that you end up with when you do something like that, because your your network uh, environment for your home connection to the internet and out to the wide world is going to have some preferential oddities. Like, for example, my connection in LA, everything I do preferentially connects to things in California first and then up into Canada before the rest of the U.S. 
my connection from my home in Las Vegas will preferentially connect to Los Angeles and then to Toronto for some reasons I don't understand before it goes anywhere else. And so that causes downstream effects. It kind of like gives me a very uh, oddly shaded view of like what my, what my connection to the internet look like. And for anyone who wants to get into this, you have to be very careful. The issue is that in IPv4, we are using the same sorts of rules that Bitcoin uses to try to create a diversity of network connections. So, for example, you know, if you had a, uh, a 40.36, we would make sure that you did not get another 40.30 through 37 network. And so the, uh, the actual peer gossip code and the connect code is making decisions about who to connect to that are... Uh, probably not as just random as you think they are. You can take a look at that uh, both in our source and in Bitcoin's source to get a sense for how that works. Uh, IPv6 is totally just the luck of the draw. So there you're getting actually whatever because you can't, you know, well, first of all, there hasn't been the pressure on the namespace to make it so that, you know, the names aren't, the numbers aren't fully spread around. Uh, and and therefore you don't have to have the same worries about getting stuck in the same V4 network. You know, you, what we don't want to have happen to give you a sense of what Bitcoin was thinking about in us too, is that all your peers are on Comcast. That would be bad. We want your peers to be in Europe and in Asia and in Canada. And so that's that code is specifically doing a lot of that behind the scenes. And to piggyback on that point again, that's why we crawl. This software is specifically designed to go find all the nodes that are typical routing protocol does not hand to you intentionally. Uh, and so this is a different piece of software. And this is how Bitcoin does it. And it's also uh, quite intentionally, we now have a very good pool of nodes we know you can connect to. Uh, if you remember when we launched, that was a bit painful and this was somewhat missing and we've been wanting to get this out and it's slowly but surely rolling out as we talk. And uh, first of all, sorry for the chainsaw in the background. There's landscapers next door apparently decided to work now, and I that's it is what it is. I don't know. Not, what to not do so bad. It. Not so bad. Uh, well, chat is definitely noticing it in YouTube for sure. Um, so I uh, got a question here for you, Gene. It came up both in YouTube and in Re and Zoom. I suspect the Zoom one is the same person bringing it over here, uh, and that is a follow up on the dust storm conversation earlier. Uh, there's still no fees to send Chia. Uh, when is that going to change? Which I think there might be some kind of a misunderstanding here on this one. Yeah. Yeah, so there are fees in Chia. It, every single thing has a minimum fee, and anything below that minimum fee is considered a zero fee. Uh, the whole idea there is, is that once you hit the tipping point from a network congestion standpoint, everything will require fees. Uh, coming out of the dust storm, the few places where uh, the user interface to fees wasn't necessarily there is or has been addressed. The one last one is that we have not released the uh, add fees to your change plot NFT yet. Uh, but most of the ex the pools have already done that. Uh, we have warned our exchanges that they need to be ready and should be doing that, and they're much more confident about that. Uh, there is also a, a fee estimator coming in either the next release or the one after that, which will allow some of the automated uh, selection of fees here. You know, And one of the selections of fees is, well, right now it's zero, and so it'll select zero. But uh, all those things are going to be in there, and in many ways, the storm was a positive to remind everybody that we needed to be ready for the day when we do get to a place where fees are required day to day. Awesome. Uh, I, I just noticed someone brought this up on YouTube. They asked why we didn't promote this AMA on, on Twitch and I'm, or Twitter. And I'm like, uh, I did. And I just checked. I had scheduled using the scheduling tool a tweet for Monday morning and a tweet for today for this, and neither one fired. So we're sorry uh, about that. That's on me. Sorry about that, folks. I did. I uh, so timing tweets on Twitter like to make sure I'm at the right place to push the right time is hard. So Twitter has a beautiful built-in system for corporate accounts that lets you pick a date and time to tweet them, and it's been incredibly reliable uh, for me for the past weeks. Almost every official tweet you've seen me tweet, 90% of them were scheduled, and I love it. But apparently, the scheduled one for Monday and the scheduled one for this morning did not go out so i am sorry about that folks that is entirely on me personally <laughs> sorry um so i got a question here for me uh two actually one is one swag and the other is chia swag when uh i'll follow by uh free hoodies for early farmers so two parts of that first is swag soon uh I, we, we have narrowed down uh, a vendor and options and how we're going to do the process and we're finalizing some designs and ideas now that are the types of designs and ideas that are easily replicatable across different products so that we don't have to like custom design an entire hoodie and an entire shirt and we can kind of reuse some of the design work between them and also incorporate some of the design cues from our recent rebranding design we did for the website to kind of be a little bit more than just the chia logo some are some are on you know there's variations we're working on but to that point i love that idea i am embarrassed to say i have not thought about it before 
but I think there is something interesting we could do. Maybe not free hoodies for every early farmer, but there's something I think we can do thanks to the blockchain uh, that we can figure out some kind of incentivizational system for either unique swag that you can only buy if you possess a certain block below a number that you were the farmer for, or perhaps a discounted or something. Um, I kind of like the idea actually of like a hoodie that's like our standard hoodie, whatever it might be, with like an extra patch or an extra logo. That's like early farmer or something for like, you know, if you're in the first day, 10,000 blocks or something, that actually might be really cool. Uh, thank you for that idea. You're an anonymous attendee for that question, but I will try to find a way to give you credit for that if I can. Um, that's actually a really cool idea and I would like to do something with that. Uh, we have about four or five minutes left. There, there's a few more questions here. Is there anything specifically one of you guys like very much wants to, wants to tackle more than anything? Well, we have to answer the Christmas movie question. Yeah, well, that's that's the last question. I'm saving that for last. Okay, yeah. good. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to. That's the closer. That. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's the one about um, ecosystem instruction. I think that's a, a good one to touch on. It's something I hear a lot from people that um, outreach into the community, outreach into developers that are doing GLISP and teaching them why our, our product is the best and why they should use it and how to use it. Um, I mean, I know the answer to this. Do you want to give the, the company line on it, Gene? No, go ahead. Okay. So uh, this is something we're actually working on. We have... Um, to, for one, we brought in uh, a lot of people focused on community experience recently. Uh, and so we're producing uh, better documentation, more documentation. Uh, the Chia Lisp site just got a, a facelift and, and got some upgrades to it and some better information added. Uh, we're doing that with an overall docs uh, rewrite as well. Uh, we're working with a couple ed education providers. I don't know if I can say the names of the people, but we're getting uh, like a really neat development ecosystem, uh, third parties developing and putting up uh, to learn Chia Lisp and to, and to build things like cats and stuff in a, in a play ecosystem on the test net. Uh, so this is something we're, we're really tuned into and it's something that we really want to invest a lot of time in over, in the next, you know, probably three or four months. Um, we're right now, we're kind of greasing the sled for all these efforts and uh, it's stuff that you can't see, but you will see pretty quickly a, a pretty big explosion of information uh, around education in particular. I want to answer one really, really quick one. Someone had a question about the last round of funding that's actually fully disclosed in the news section of our website. Mm -hmm. It's approximately uh, June when that news came out, but the actual financing was done May 3rd, right before our first transaction. Okay. Um, there, there's a question in YouTube someone asked that kind of follows on your previous one, uh, Gene, about transaction fees. Uh, and they basically asked, you know, several years from now, when comparing then to what, say, ETH and Bitcoin look like now, uh, what do we think the fee structure will look like? I can kind of start that with considering how many more transactions we can fit into a block compared to those. Uh, probably not on a similar scale as high because that's kind of part of the whole premise behind Chia's use case is that uh, we should not have the problem that gas has. So where you have these, you know, ludicrous moments where this weekend I tried to play around with an NFT and it was going to cost me like $400 in gas fees for a $30 uh, uh costing effort and i was just like nope not gonna mess with that now you know uh because you can fit so many more transactions into a block that the need for fees will still be there but not at as high of a, a rate to get them but if you want to go into that a bit more feel free yeah i mean look you know long term you do actually want a fee market that has real value and the idea is that the layer one is only going to be moving your larger transactions or your more important transactions and this is why we have layer two uh functionality in the roadmap during the year this coming calendar year uh we can implement lightning quite easily. Uh, and it's likely it will be one of, if not, uh, you know, one of a few things we'll be doing next year on L2. Um, the, you know, the idea here is, is that not every transaction needs to be on the first layer blockchain, every single block. But, you know, Bram does say, and I think everybody should think about it this way, that ultimately, say, three to five years from now, the real question about whether your transaction should be on layer one or not is, is it worth 100 bucks? If it's worth 100 bucks in fees, then yes, it absolutely should be on layer one. If it's not, then you should be rolling up. You should be going through Lightning and, you know, your $5 or your NFT. You know, yeah, you might be in a slightly riskier scenario in your Lightning channel for a few minutes with your NFT until it settles out. But that's fine. Okay. Uh, any last ones you want to cover for sure before I do our closing question? Unfortunately, I have to run, so we should cover the fail. Right. Apologies to those whose questions we didn't get to. Uh, you know, we might think about making these ninety minutes in the future, but I feel like no matter how long these are, we will always have questions at the end. So I feel like it's an unavoidable uh, cost of this. All right, that said, uh, gentlemen, what is your favorite Christmas movie to watch when you take your holiday break? Die Hard. 
I mean, that, that, that's my answer. So that, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go completely out of left field. Uh, the Jim Henson classic, a Muppet Christmas Carol. Okay. Uh, that so movie slaps. So you, so I was going to follow with because Gene took Die Hard. My next is going to be a tie between Muppet Christmas Carol because yes, that movie slaps and uh, Scrooge's theme song is a freaking banger. Yes. Like, it can be yes. July. I'm sitting outside yeah. with a pina colada in a hundred degree weather. And that song, that organ in, in that song. Yeah. There goes Mr. It, it just pops up in my yeah. head. and won't go away. I love that. But also if we're talking about Jim Henson and Christmas, there is the often forgotten, but way beloved a Muppet family Christmas where they all go to Fozzie's mom's house for Christmas and you've got Sesame Street, you've got the Muppets and you've got Fraggle Rock all in one it is fantastic it is awesome, Indeed. if you can find a copy online it's hard to find because there's a lot of uh, uh, songs they only had the rights to for like the one year's broadcast and they rebuy uh-huh. the rights for the second year and if you find copies online now every copy I have found is clearly a VHS recording with scan lines and classic like 80's commercials and then converted to digital and some of them you can tell there's like a it feels like a weird cut because they cut out a song because it was a right. second or a third year replay and they had to cut out songs to play it on TV to do it. But if you can find an original, it's like an hour and a half long and it's really good. So happy holidays and Merry Christmas, everybody. I got a bolt. <laughs> all right. See y'all. Thank you all for you coming. It's been great. Uh, and we will talk to you all in the new year.